let me just preface her presentation with um, how I met uh, met her. It was a couple of years ago at a smart driving car uh, summit in New Jersey, and a lot of great presentations there. There were terrific presentations about the future of mobility, and she came on and spoke and blew everyone away. Uh, so it, it's something that um, her organization has been, you know, providing this idea of helping seniors transition from driver seats to the passenger seat and helping seniors with mobility. And in San, San Jose alone, we have 125,000 people who are 65 plus. With that, I think there's a definite need here. And, uh, and Catherine comes to us from Maine. So I, uh, I, first I wanna thank you for joining us, Catherine, and I will bring up your presentation. Thank you very much. I, I, uh, I get very nervous when people give me introductions like that because that's impossible to live up to, but thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have, I think about 30 slides and um, I wanna leave some time for questions at the end. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly through them pretty quickly. Um, and I hope that this holds together for you. I, I wanna begin by saying um, probably a little arrogantly um, that I think when Maslow set up his hierarchy, he made a major mistake. Um, he put physiological needs at the bottom and he absolutely forgot mobility. And, you know, he has basic things like, you know, food and shelter and, um, air and sex and all the basics. Um, and he forgot mobility and without mobility, none of the others happen. It's that important. It's what distinguishes the living animal kingdom from the living plant kingdom. And that that's, seems a little extreme, but plants are living, but they're silent and they're still. And we animals, we move around and we make lots of noise. Uh, so it's that very basic to who we are being alive and I think it's that basic need to move that propels people uh, to pay so much attention to transportation and all the different ways that we do move. So that when you can't drive and you can't get around, it's that kind of a fundamental loss to who you are as a living person. So um, let, me, let me just go through these slides and get less philosophical. I get accused of being too philosophical. Uh, so uh, if you could just go to the next slide, please, thanks. Okay, so I just wanna say IT in America uh, is um, the first and it's still the only national nonprofit transportation network for mobility for older people and people with special needs. And we take a very holistic approach. We don't just provide technology, although that's really core to what we do, but we have built a research database underneath our technology uh, it has 178 fields for data collection. We have over, well over a million rides in the database. So we, we really study uh, how people travel, um, where they go, uh, what they do, whether or not they travel alone and so forth. It, it's very, very, very important. We also work in public policy, training, um, education, uh, and we of course support transportation programs just under 100 across the United States now. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about a new model that we are, are now implementing uh, in about nine communities across the country. It's called ITN Country, uh, and, and it is a very flexible, low cost model um, in the cloud. Um, and it's built on the original model that we developed for transportation which is a model that provides service 24 hours a day, seven days a week for older people. Uh, and I wanna say that it existed several years before Uber and several years before Lyft. So we, we realized that the kind of mobility that many people need is a small vehicle that comes to their door and often someone who will provide some assistance carry packages, open a door. Uh, here in Maine, it, it's a very big deal to offer a steady arm on an icy sidewalk, those kinds of things. So we've been doing it uh, for 26 years. Um, and uh, we're now rolling out uh, this model that we believe will scale to many communities across the country. 
um, especially small and rural communities that do not have the density for traditional mass transportation solutions. Next slide, please. So this is an important slide. Um, in the years that we've been working on transportation, um, the, the underlying problem, at least from my perspective, in there being sufficient transportation is that it's actually very expensive and it's more expensive than most people realize. So, you know, public transportation is heavily subsidized by the government, federal, state, and local. People do not pay the true cost of a ride. Uh, and when people stop driving, even though they're willing to pay lots of money for their cars, they don't really have a realistic understanding of what an individual ride of a driver who comes to their door. Uber and Lyft, of course, do that, but neither Uber nor Lyft make a profit, and they're underwritten by their investors uh, rather than by the government. So to build a sustainable uh, solution, which really has been our vision from the very beginning, we came up, and we're a nonprofit, so we look at resources very differently. We came up with a lot of innovative ways uh, for people to pay for the cost of their ride. And to hold that equity, we used technology and we created an account in the software called a personal transportation account. That concept is fundamental to what we are doing. Um, and we also looked at equity in, in many different ways. A lot of older people have cars they can no longer drive. We created a program where people can trade the car to pay for their rides. It's a very successful program. Although I will tell you, everybody told me that I was absolutely nuts when I thought anybody would trade their car. Um, but uh, you know what I said was, uh, I know what people care about more than their cars, believe it or not. They care about their independence and they care about their freedom. And when they can't drive that car anymore and it's sat in the driveway, I just heard you talking about cars sitting on the street. When those cars that people can't drive sit in their driveway for a year or so, they begin to think about, you know, maybe I'd rather be able to get around since I can't drive that anymore. So we created that program. We also created programs where the destination, uh, a supermarket or a healthcare provider will help to pay for the ride. Um, we also have scholarships for people who cannot afford to pay for rides. And we have a system where you can get a credit for volunteering to drive someone else. And you can store that credit in your personal transportation account. And then, you know, when you are older, uh, with your credit stored up, someone else will drive you. So you can pay it forward. So it, it's electronic currency. It's sort of transportation Bitcoin, if you will. But we've been doing it for many years and, and it works. It's tested. So now we're, it's built into the system of rolling it out with our rural model. Next slide, please. So the, there are two different kinds of communities that may want to participate in ITN countries. So this, it could be a community that has no transportation at all, and there are just thousands across the United States, uh, or it could be a community that has an existing transportation provider that would like to join the platform and participate in these different innovative programs um, and connect uh, to other communities around the country. Next slide, please. So talk a bit about the technology. We're pretty excited about it. And, and I wanna begin by saying that um, it, for me anyway, I, I think that the little guys don't have the benefit of the good technology and it really bothers me. Um, and uh, so we're, we're a charitable nonprofit building technology. That's a very unusual thing to do. Um, I actually wouldn't wish it on anybody because if you think it's hard to capitalize growth, you should try capitalizing technology as a charitable nonprofit. It is, it is uh, not for wimps. Uh, however, it is extremely important to do because the communities, uh, the small communities that need this technology, um, they're, they're doing transportation in spiral notebooks and Excel spreadsheets if they're sophisticated. Uh, and as I think everybody in San Jose knows, technology creates efficiency. And it's very important when resources are scarce to be able to do that. Next slide, please. So we, we have some industry partners, Salesforce and Esri. I'm sure you all know Esri. Um, Jack Dangerbin has been incredibly generous to us. He has donated the routing algorithms for the whole United States. And that's a major part of why we're able to provide technology inexpensively and good technology at that. 
Next slide, please. So this is a picture of our old technology. I call it the 55 Chevy. Uh, it's clunky, uh, but um, it's supported over a million rides. Uh, it's the basis for what we're building now. Next slide, please. There's our new look. Okay, we're building it um, in, on Salesforce uh, in the cloud. Next slide, please. So that's the disclaimer that my IT manager makes me put in everything. Next slide, please. This is, we, um, we hired a, a marketing firm that uh, would help us assure that everything we build is accessible to people with visual impairment. The screens are designed so that there is not uh, too much of a cognitive load and all of the colors uh, work for people who are colorblind who have other kinds of visual impairment, as do all of the fonts. Next slide, please. Lots of security. Uh, we love being on the Salesforce platform because we know how careful they are with security and we're using people's personal information. You know, it, it's just essential. Next slide, please. So um, the original software that we built was uh, desktop and it was used by people in an office, but the new technology has portals. Um, the concept behind what we are doing, and I'm gonna use a metaphor for you here, but I want you to take it with a grain of salt, okay? What we, what we are doing is Uber or Lyft for volunteer drivers in the nonprofit sector, okay? That's, that's the quick um, comparison that will help you understand what we are doing, but it is not exactly like that. Uh, it, it, it is community-based and community-supported. So there are portals for all the different components of the community that participate in the system. So there's, of course, the, the staff, you know, volunteer and paid. Um, but then there are the riders, there are the families of the riders, and there are the caregivers. You know, for the data we have now for the ITN affiliates, and that's what our data is based on, um, the most common age, the modal age is 85. The median age is 83 uh, and the mean is 80. Uh, so very often it's caregivers and family who are logging in and who, or who will be logging in. Right now they're calling us on the telephone. Uh, but mobility um, is a family affair. Um, so drivers uh, volunteer and paid also can access the system through a portal, through a smartphone, or through a desktop or a tablet, and then businesses and healthcare providers who definitely care about people getting to their door, either as customers or as um, clients or as patients. Uh, so, so that gives you a sense of how the technology in the cloud, uh, everybody can participate in it. You know, and that means, for example, that an adult child can log in and schedule a, a ride for their parent, um, or a volunteer can log in and check what rides are available. Next slide, please. Um, so that's just a picture of staff. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the functions that staff can do. Book a ride, edit a ride, schedule drivers. Um, I, I'm going to, you guys can keep these slides. I just ask that you please don't circulate them on the internet, okay? Because once they get out on the internet, um, they take on a life of their own. And I change the slides for every single presentation. Um, but these are the different people who could use it at the staff end. And these are the different functions. Manage your fleet, uh, you know, document your drivers, make sure that you've done your criminal history check and your moving violation check and you've got the information on their insurance, you know, all of those things that are so important to know that vulnerable passengers are safe. You know, it's all stored in the system. Um, next slide, please. Are we going backwards? Oh, this is families and caregivers. Okay, so um, uh, a lot of people really prefer to schedule their rides with a telephone. They don't wanna use a smartphone. You know, of course, more and more people, I hear this discussion all the time, more and more people will be in the future. Clearly somebody came to the door. <laughs> 
So I hear people say that, you know, people, everybody be using a smartphone in the future, to which I say, what makes you think there still will be smartphones? I mean, we just don't know what technology will create in the future. The truth is that different age cohorts use different technologies. And if you have a system that's accessible to everybody, you have to be able to, you know, really use all the different technologies. So ride requests in this system can be made online. They can be made by phone. Payments are secure. You can look at your personal ride history when you log in through the portal um, and special needs are easily documented in the system. Next slide, please. And special needs make a very big difference for mobility for vulnerable people. Rider applications uh, are available online and every rider has a profile with their special needs. Everybody, you know, I mean, everybody has special needs. And by the time you're 80, believe me, you have special needs. Um, you, can, you can trade your car, you know, all the different things that the system can do, you can do online. Next slide, please. I'm gonna speak too long and you're not gonna have time for questions. So I'm gonna try to hurry up here. Um, so this is drivers, they want to, now uh, volunteer drivers are very important to this system. Um, and it's a major part of what keeps the system uh, sustainable. Um, uh, so there's a lot of volunteers want to participate. Some are willing to be scheduled a block of time, but many volunteers just want to be able to log on, see what ride needs to be done and pick up that ride and do it. You can do either of those with this system. They both work. Um, next slide, please. Oh, that's just a picture of a driver manifest. You get all the information about people's special needs and, um, and believe me, it, it's very helpful if the person is visually impaired or hard of hearing or need, has a walker or a cane, uh, needs help getting down the stairs. That's the kind of information you want cooked into the system so that it, it doesn't take a lot of time for ride coordinators to share it. Next slide, please. So the drivers, um, whether volunteer or paid, um, can also access all of this functionality online. Um, transportation Social Security, I just wanna say that's, that's the name we have for the program where you earn volunteer credits um, and you save them. And you, know, you can also give them to people. I mean, I, I have a dear friend who recently found out he had a brain tumor and can't drive anymore. And you know, I just shipped him a bunch of credits and opened an account for him so that someone would drive him. Um, uh, new applications go right into the Salesforce database. It's a seamless, frictionless system, as frictionless as we can make it. Yeah. Next slide, please. So business, business and healthcare portal. Um, I, I really, we've got the basics of this in, in our current statement of work, but I really want to build this out because I think participation by the community is the key to um, sort of health and connection for a community-based solution. Um, next slide, please. Um, you can manage your funders. You know, if you are a provider and you have many different funding streams, you can manage those funding streams through this system. And that's a real work saver for transportation providers. We also built it, the system, so that it's compatible with the Federal Transit Administration's National Transportation Database, and also with um, HHS. Next slide, please. Um, these are different sources of public funding that many providers want to be able to use. They can all be used in this system. Next slide, please. Um, that's just a screen that shows you you can manage grants through the system, which is important for nonprofits. Next slide, please. Um, marketing is hugely important for a system that is based on community support. You know, we think of marketing as being for the for-profit sector and in the nonprofit sector, it's euphemistically called community outreach, but it's the exact same thing where you connect with an organization that benefits by the service you provide and what you do, and you find a way to work together to support that service. Um, next slide, please. So opportunities for networks. I think this is the last slide and I think this is one of my favorites. 
The community in the cloud refers to all of the different services that we have available to support communities, whether it's a database of public policies for all 50 states that remove barriers to the use of private resources, um, or you know, a library of reference material and, and marketing information. There's, there's a tremendous amount of support that, that we will be offering uh, to communities that want to participate in this. But what I really want to mention to you is something that I did not anticipate that is emerging that I'm really excited about. Um, I have long suspected that many, many, many nonprofit organizations that provide services and goods for populations in need are impeded in their mission by a lack of transportation. And sure enough, the uh, Good Shepherd Food Bank in Maine, which is the only food bank in Maine, and it's one of 200 in the United States, and it serves 600 food pantries in the state of Maine. They have a massive transportation problem. And if you think about it, people who can't afford food very often can't afford a car. Right, So they can't get to the pantries. And then the volunteers in the pantries are willing to drive, but they have no efficient way to set up routes and connect. So we're now working with the Good Shepherd Food Bank to pilot, you know, because what we've got is technology that creates a network of volunteers in the community. Uh, so it can not only take people to the doctor, it can help people get to food. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. The, the other one that we're working on is with the Maine governor's office. We're calling it the Clean Commute uh, Project. Um, I serve on the Climate Change Committee in Maine, and they're worried about improving mobility in rural communities where the only real means of transportation is the private automobile. And the private automobile, the more you drive it, the more air pollution it creates. So uh, the Clean Commute Project that we're working on is going to put an electric vehicle into each of our uh, ITAN country projects in Maine communities. And uh, underemployed people or low-income people are going to drive other people to work who don't have cars. And when the cars are not being used to get people to work, they're going to be used for older people and people with special needs. So it's good for the environment and it's good for employment in, in rural communities. So that's the Clean Commute Program. So summarizing, what is ITN Country? It is a technology that gets behind local communities to help them create their own transportation networks um, to serve their own needs uh, with their own name on it. And we're, we are behind you. We are. We say you are powered by ITN Country, um, and uh, and that's it. That, I hope I didn't go too fast or get too detailed. I think I left seven minutes for questions. So yeah, Catherine, that was an excellent presentation. And I before we get to the, it looks like we have several hands raised. I want to uh, point out that we uh, Sam has joined us uh, from uh, West Valley Community Services, and they run a, a group called. Um, uh, called, uh, it's interesting. Oh, there you are. Um, it's a group called uh, Ride, which is, uh, I'll, why don't you, Sam, why don't you explain that for a minute, and then we'll go into questions and answers with uh, Catherine. Sure. So Ride is a senior transportation program for ambulatory adults over the age of 65 who live in um, Campbell, Cupertino, Los Gatos, Montessorino, Saratoga, um, Morgan Hill and four San Jose zip codes right now, though I think we are looking to expand a little bit more. Um, and we only operate during the weekdays, but we can take clients to pretty much anything they need within eight miles, but 16 miles for medical appointments. So wonderful. And and, and uh, I'm in the 95128 zip code, so we're just outside that. And that was one of the motivations I had for this: is how do we get you know this kind of this 24 hours, seven days a week, countywide type of service, uh, and and 
hearing what Catherine did, it just seemed like there's some great synergy. It also could be a great way to, it seems like energize neighborhoods, neighborhood associations, you know, finding volunteers and that sort of thing. So with that, uh, I think Amy had her hand up. Thank you for the presentation. This seems like a really um, you know, important and useful service for a lot of people. That was one of the questions I had is um, if it was a 24 seven service that's provided, because I know uh, there are early morning surgeries or, or early morning airport um, departures. Um, I was also wondering in some of the smaller communities, if some of the riders request um, drivers that they're comfortable with or familiar with, and if that can be accommodated. Um, and then just clarification, so it's not personal vehicles, or is it sometimes personal vehicles? I know sometimes you need specialized vehicles with wheelchair lifts or whatever. Um, so those, uh, those questions. Okay, um, so um, the idea of ITN country, the new model that we are rolling out is that every community can decide for itself the answer to the questions you just asked. If your community wants to have service 24 seven, the system supports that. If your community wants to have service as SAM services provided Monday through Friday, you can do that as well. If you wanna use private vehicles, you can use private vehicles. If you wanna use vans, you can use vans. If you wanna use both, you can use both. So it, it, is, a, a, it is a system that supports your local choices and your local decisions. Um, the original ITN that we built, which was the model program, was much more like a franchise and you had to use cars and you had to provide service 24 seven. And, and you know, I still, that model is still running here today. But what we found as we were, you know, we, in our customer satisfaction surveys, customer satisfaction on the 24 seven model is between 95 and 98% for more than 10 years. I mean, people love that service, but it wasn't scaling fast enough to meet the need of people. And so we realized that uh, we needed to have a model that was a lot more flexible and that instead of sort of getting in front of communities with a brand, that it was much more important to get behind communities and support them to make their own decisions about what they wanted to do. So uh, I would say we're a service model. We serve the communities. You decide what you wanna do and, and we'll support you to do it. You know, in, in the understanding that whatever you do, you have to figure out how to provide it, right? If you wanna have 24 seven service, you've got to recruit volunteers or pay drivers 24 seven, right? It, it, it's what you build. You know, we're, we're the support system for what you build. Does that, does that answer your question? It does. And in some of the smaller communities, do um, riders, do they request certain drivers? Is that a possibility or is that just too difficult? No, you can do that if you want to. You can do that. People need, need rides. I mean, I just volunteered to do a 5.30 a.m. Saturday dialysis ride. Um, I'll be doing it the day after Christmas. Um, and then I'm gonna, I don't mind getting up. I can't sleep at night anyway, big deal, you know? So I'm up and driving, you know? I'm up anyway, watching Netflix. I may as well be doing some good. Uh, so um, if you set up a system that's gonna say you'll take people to dialysis at 5.30 in the morning, you gotta find people who will do it, but you can find people who will do it. I really believe in people and I believe in volunteerism with my whole heart. People will help each other if you help them figure out a way to do it. They will, people will do it. Anybody else have a question for me? Who's that black cat? I did have a question about liability. You know, how do you protect the drivers? Um, that's a good question. And it's, it's actually the number one question that is asked. The answer is that liability is, is a policy issue and it is individual to every state. 
So it, it is insurance. Insurance is a state uh, power, not a federal power. Um, and, and generally speaking, the volunteer's automobile insurance covers himself or herself. In California, you are blessed. You have the best laws for volunteer drivers in the country, you know, and you have the best insurance policies. So you should be covered by your own insurance. If you call your agent and your agent tells you you're not covered if you volunteer, there is an excellent chance that your agent is wrong um, because the agents give you different information than the companies give you. There's a wonderful report published by AARP in the last probably 18 months about insurance uh, and volunteer drivers. But you should you should be fine. You should be fine. All right, thank you. You're welcome. So I had a question about um, people pay for this. It looks like um, they sign up to pay for this. And what do they put money aside or do they pay for individual ride? And how does that compare with the, what Uber and Lyft would charge? Um, the answer to that question is that I, I like it when the dogs bark at each other across the Zoom. That's when it's really good. Um, the answer is that um, your community, let's say you set up uh, an ITN system, uh, an, uh, an ITN country system in your community, um, you can decide as a community uh, if you want to charge or not. Um, a lot of the small volunteer organizations don't charge. Um, I personally believe in charging something for services. I, I think it's good for everybody to have skin in the game. Um, and you can, you can, with this system, you can charge by the mile or you can charge a flat rate and you can set that rate however you want. So if your community decides it wants to charge, like, like most of the ITN affiliates, they have a pickup charge and a mileage charge. Um, and they have a charge for off hours. You know, If you want to go to the airport at 4.30 in the morning, and people do, um, there's an extra charge for someone to get up and take you at 4.30 in the morning. Um, if your community decides you want to do those rides for free, you can do it for free. I'm a big fan of free choice. This is a free choice system. So I understand that you're asking me these questions because you're thinking there are rules, but there really aren't rules. You get to decide what you want to do. It, you know, and what, and so I'll tell you also there is, um, we have an online learning system that's part of community in the cloud. And the first, I think it's 10 or 11 lessons are free and available to the public. And so you can, you can go in and they're like little, little planning exercises. One is how do you decide what service area you want? Another is, um, how do you decide if you wanna charge for a ride or not? Another is, what kind of a budget should you have? Uh, another is, you know, do you use paid or volunteer drivers? And if, you put, if you're interested in doing this, if you put together a group of people, you could go through these exercises and we can help you if you need any help. And you can answer these questions for yourself. And by the time you get through with it, you will say, okay, we want our service area to go from here to here. And we've decided that we want to provide service on Saturdays, uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, and we've decided that we want to have a flat fee. And we've decided that we want to do it all with volunteers, or we want to have paid staff to do the ride coordination, and we want to have volunteers do you will go through this planning process and it just, it takes you through it and helps you answer these questions in a way so that when you come out the other end, you can say, you know, we need transportation uh, for people, older people and people with special needs and, and this would work and this is about what it would cost or, you know, 
no, we don't want to do this. You know, and that's free. It's available online. I'll provide the information to you. Like help you do that. Does that help? Yeah, and I yeah. just just oh, for ahead, experience, Doris. I just was wondering how it might, with what you have, how the rides might compare with what Uber or Lyft would charge. That half the price is, you know. It's generally speaking half the price of a taxi. Okay. And Uber and Lyft, I, I can't compare to them because in the very beginning they were they were only charging about 40% of what a ride really costs. Um, so um, they were very unrealistic prices. Now they're more, they're trying to be profitable. So they're charging, you know, a lot more for rides. Um, I can tell you this, we're a hell of a lot more dependable and we're much more focused on the people and we're not focused on the money. We're focused on the people, we're mission driven, and the people who participate in the service are participating because they care about the people they're driving. It's very it's a, totally, yeah. it's a different experience. I can also share with you um, I did a white paper, an environmental scan of all senior transportation in the United States for the CDC a couple of years ago. I'll send you guys the link to that paper. And um, it, it really, um, it, it kind of looks at the difference between different kinds of ride share services. Um, but this is, this is a service that's about service. It's about people. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. It, it's a privilege to join you today. I, I meant to say that. Thank you for having me. Catherine, thank you. I um, I put some links in uh, the chat while you were uh, talking. The last link being, I think it's the report, the NORC uh, report, I believe, is the white paper of the environmental yeah. scan. It, I think that was the one you were just mentioned. It's an excellent yeah. read. I, I read it yesterday, and uh, uh, you know, very uh, a very good <laughs> view of what the the market looks like. Um, there's also, I think, I found the AARP one. It shows seven states, California being one of them, where you know, the insurance is taken care of because they, they basically the state legislature uh, handled it. Uh, there's also a link to ITN Monterey, which is the closest um, ITN affiliate to us, I believe. And it, it, it is, if you go to that yep. link, that has a good overview. And, yep, and there's two ITN countries starting up there in the next year, okay. right, right around Monterey, because they've got a lot of rural area. It's a huge exactly. county. And, uh, and Santa Clara. Santa Clara County has a lot of rural areas as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I so appreciate now the slides themselves. Um, do you, I, I mean, I'm, is it okay to link to, to provide the slides to the group here in a, a link or an email? Yeah, you or something? can provide it to people. I'm just asking you all to just please don't post them on the internet. You know, yeah. share them among yourselves, but please don't post them on the internet. And the reason I say that is not very long ago, I came across a slide deck from 2009 that I presented in Australia. You know, trust me, it wasn't relevant anymore. Um, so I, I just don't like these things flying around on the internet that are, um, that are, they're no longer relevant. And people see it on the internet and they think it's the truth, right? Yeah. But things get outdated really, really quickly. So yeah, you can share it with everybody in the group and, and anybody is welcome to contact me if you want to with any any questions. Um, and and I'm happy to try to help. Okay, super. And then uh, uh, the recording, then I'll make sure I just cut off this part that edit <laughs> when I edit it, I'll just cut out your presentation and right because this will be on the internet. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as much as I'd love to keep it because it's got great stuff, but I'll definitely be doing a write-up especially for this. Uh, so Steve, that'll take the burden off of you, but uh, I want to make sure this, your story gets out there. And, and this is really just part of the story. So um, with that, I, I want to thank you very much, Catherine. And, and as we turn it over to Vice, before you leave, as we turn it over to the Vice Mayor, especially as his uh, additional role as Chair of the VTA, just wondering if you have any comments or or thoughts? 
Oh, the only uh, comment that I have is uh, I would I, I would love to continue to work with you and figure out a way that uh, VTA, as well as the city of San Jose, can support this initiative. I think it uh, would be really valuable for our community and beneficial. So I look forward to to working with you and and others to try to make something happen. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. And, um, and